If you go ahead and turn to the book of James, chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 21. Hmm. Feels like we should be uh, in the middle of something, but I suppose we are, really. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to preach this morning, to give your word and your message. I pray you'd have your will in this service, and let me say only that you want to have said. In your name, amen. All right, so to wrap up a series on Abraham, the logical choice would be to finish off his story in Genesis. But I've never been much for logical choices, I suppose. I find it, well, I won't say interesting, because I always say interesting. I find it fascinating, uh, Abraham's prevalence in the New Testament, and that one attribute of his, his faith, is brought up over and over again, basically every time he's mentioned. Abraham's presence in the New Testament shouldn't be terribly surprising. For the most part, the New Testament is written towards a Hebrew audience, or at least an audience that is heavily influenced by Hebrew culture. And Abraham would be seen in roughly the same light, probably a little more respected, than George Washington is seen as a, in ours. He is the father of the nation. I suppose you could make an argument for uh, King Arthur in English culture, if you want to go way back towards more mythological figures. Because uh, no one in England seems to really revere William the Conqueror, who actually created what we would recognize as England. But since he was a French dude who conquered their island, I suppose there's a reason he's not terribly well remembered. There's a reason he's called the Conqueror. But even in our uh, goofy little, to get kind of back on point, even in our young country, uh, we have great historical figures that we revere. George Washington is relatively young as far as uh, world famous world figures go. He's only about 200 years old, or 200 years young, I suppose I should say. But he holds a special place with a lot of Americans, or did once upon a time. Let's not get into that this morning. And one of his attributes is often focused on above and beyond any others, his renowned honesty, which is hilarious because in real life, George Washington was actually a brilliant tactician when it came to misdirection and spy tactics. So he was specifically a good military commander because the man was very good at lying. So it's hilarious that he has the reputation of being the little boy who couldn't lie about chopping down cherry trees, because from what we know of him, that was completely in character for him to lie about that. But Abraham, for the New Testament Jews, would be significantly older than George Washington is to us. He would have been many more centuries in the past. And his attribute of faith is perhaps better historically uh, documented. Abraham was a great man of faith, as we have discovered many times throughout this little mini-series on Abraham. But what does it mean exactly, not only for the folks back in New Testament times, but for us today? What do we get out of Abraham and his character? We know that he gets brought up a lot in the New Testament, but what is he used to illustrate? What is the point, if you will, of continually returning to this guy? Well, for the sake of figuring that out, I think we should probably go back to the beginning of this particular passage. So continuing in James chapter 2, where we will be all morning, so keep it bookmarked. James chapter 2, all the way back at verse 1. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? 
For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motive? <laughs> the relevance to Abraham, please. Well, certainly. It's... <coughs> Bless you. <coughs> Bless you. I think we'll get another Abraham and another president into this. I should have saved this for President's Day, I suppose. Uh, today's opening quotation from Abraham Lincoln. The idea that right makes might instead of the more popular alternative where if you are in the right, you will have strength on your side. Because the creator of this universe had a strong moral character, so those who have strong moral characters will have the creator on their side, is more or less the uh, basic concept. And I think that's more or less what James is going for here. The idea that if you are truly trusting in God, then there's no reason to play favorites. That trying to appeal to the rich and powerful is attempting to put your faith in something besides God. That you're trying to get Jeff Bezos on your side more than you are Christ. And that's... <laughs> well, James kind of goes on to explain why that's not necessarily a good plan. Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? So uh, he's kind of jiving with modern American there, isn't he? Uh, focus on the poor and their importance because they're the ones who are going to inherit the kingdom of God. Aren't the rich people, generally speaking, the ones who will oppress you in the first place? Aren't they the ones who you need to be rescued from more often than they come to your rescue? And it's important to remember the context of these verses. This is a, I believe James was writing to the uh, church in Jerusalem. Do we actually know who James was writing to? I could have sworn it was Jerusalem. The twelve tribes scattered abroad, it says. Ah, that's even better. <laughs> I'm glad for the sake of the sermon. Because that means he is writing to the Jewish people who have been displaced for centuries now and have been oppressed by one great power to another. From Babylon to Persia to Alexander the Great and now Rome. These people would know far better than anyone, well, not anyone, I suppose, these people would be very familiar with how the rich and powerful treat people more often than not, as Israel at this point is not a rich and powerful nation and is constantly at the mercy of Rome, which will ultimately culminate in the horrific events of AD 70. But even more than that, these aren't just Jews that James is writing to. These are Christian Jews. These are people who are now being oppressed by the rich and powerful members of their own community, with the Pharisees, Sadducees, and some nutcase named Saul on their tracks at this point. So they have even more reason to uh, not play favorites, as it were. It would be tempting, of course, that if a rich and powerful man in the Jewish or Roman community happens on one of these Christian gatherings to give him a great place of prominence and treat him with all the respect and admiration that you could muster. But James doesn't necessarily say that's a bad idea. He's not telling you to spit in the face of rich people who try to be a part of your community. He's just saying don't do it at the expense of the poor. He's saying don't play favorites, that you should treat everyone with respect and honor. That you shouldn't 
Focus on those who can help you in this life at the expense of the meek and poor who will inherit the kingdom in the next life. Pretty straightforward stuff. And I think in a lot of ways you see that borne out in Abraham's life when you get down to it. I think probably Abraham's bravest act, which is an impressive accomplishment, considering this is the man who left his home and family behind, and later on is willing to sacrifice his own son on the chance that God will bring him back to life. But I think Abraham's probably greatest act is that time he kind of sort of haggled with God for the lives of two ridiculously wicked cities for the sake of a nephew who, as discussed last time, had kind of sort of double-crossed him. And he's willing to go up to the almighty king of the universe for the sake of two wicked kingdoms that had the best land in the area. It probably actively benefited Abraham when Sodom and Gomorrah got wiped off the face of the earth, as they were wicked cultures with heavy influence in the region. They don't really seem the kind of people to discourage banditry, for example. And I presume a lot of the more rogue elements of society got taken with Sodom and Gomorrah. But even though it would actively hurt Abraham for Sodom and Gomorrah to endure, he's still willing to try to save them for the sake of his poor nephew. He is attempting to put the themes of, well, not really the themes of God, because it obviously benefits the kingdom for Sodom and Gomorrah to go. But he's still trying to put his family and connections above his earthly gain. He's more focused on family than he is on worldly riches, no matter what, no matter how it hurts his bottom line. But we haven't actually mentioned Abraham again yet in this chapter, so I suppose we should press on. Verse 8. Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. I like the sound of royal law better than the golden rule, honestly. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, congratulations, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. And I suppose we should take the time to knock Abraham a little down off of his pedestal, because we don't want to overly grandize this guy. No one should be treated as if they were completely perfect. And Abraham was really good, but he has a couple broken laws in his history. The treatment of Haggai and Ishmael immediately comes to mind. And perhaps even having the guts to argue with God isn't necessarily a good character trait. But it follows through simple logic that if there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy, there will be mercy for you if you have yourself been merciful. And that this law that sets us free which is an interesting idea, that it will be in your corner, as it were, if you have conducted yourself in a forgiving, merciful manner. A law that sets you free. Americans don't really like to act like that's a thing, but it is. Rules and laws perhaps don't, aren't freedom in themselves, but they do provide freedom. If I wanted to, I could up and leave to the other side of the continent after I'm done preaching here, because the rules and laws of America provide me freedom to move about as I would. You don't necessarily have that in a lot of other cultures, the freedom for you to do 
what you want to without Uncle Sam constantly looking over your shoulder. I think that's one of the great understated advantages of living in a society with rules and laws and regulations. As annoying as some of them are, to be fair, it still beats the alternative of an anarchic mess where everyone's out for their own good. If we press forward here on to verse 14, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? That's a bit blunt on James's part. Continuing the message of the chapter here, I think he's saying that if you say you have <coughs> faith and believe and trust in God for everything, but then immediately turn around and try to pander to the rich and powerful, your faith is not being borne out in your actions. So he's going to move the message further to criticize people who act like that. And it's an interesting idea, the balance between what you believe and what you do. Perhaps the most familiar example us modern folk would be is George Mueller, the incredible man from the turn of the century, 1800s to 1900s. That's some yeah, dude who lived a while ago in England. Yeah. <laughs> who built countless orphanages, constantly put himself out there to care for the poor and sick, and never really asked anybody for anything, instead trusting solely on God to help him as he went about establishing his great work. And I think he was probably in God's will for that. But I think I won't be taking pot shots at George Mueller this morning. But I don't necessarily think the Bible supports copycatting him any more than Joshua was commanded to go make war with the infidels, which means we should always be picking fights with non-believers and chopping heads off. Just because Joshua or George Mueller was told to do it doesn't mean Joshua or a random dude named George is told to do it. Verse 15. Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and say, goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? That's why I like the New Living Translation. <laughs> so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. And uh, I won't really be expanding that in any way, to be honest, because I think that gets the point across. You can say you're a good, strong, solid Christian all you want. If you're not acting like it, what good does that do anymore? If you go to church on a regular basis, if you memorize scripture, if you sing the songs and play the part, and don't actually lift a finger to help your fellow man, not a strong Christian, to be honest. Which is, I suppose, sitting in judgment of other, other people, but in my defense, I'm just repeating what an apostle said, so you found a problem with it, take it up with him, because it's in the Bible. Faith doesn't do a lot of good without actions. <laughs> I suppose a more relevant way of rewording that is a relationship doesn't do a lot of good without a religion. Boy, am I stepping on toes with that, but none of the people who actually say that are here. So The, I, the Bible specifically calls Christianity a religion. And that when that particular religion is <coughs> at its best being used to its fullest extent, the use it was meant for, it's charity work. That when you go out and feed the sick and poor, that is Christianity in action. So as much as we may not like the taboo word of a religion in this day and age, you can have a relationship with Christ all you want. 
if that's not actually resulting in a Christian lifestyle, it's not doing anyone else any good. And with that, I believe Abraham, <laughs> almost, we're almost there, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, this part was basically tailor-made, I think, for the future movements of um, agnosticism. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you say that? see that faith without good deeds is useless? It's a fascinating thought, that belief in God alone isn't actually enough to make you a Christian. That if you take that giant step to believe in a singular creator deity that created the universe around you, but don't go further than that, then you have raised yourself from the level of atheist to demon. And I love that the Bible puts atheists below demons. Uh, it's not important, not important. But that is what sets Christianity aside from other monotheistic religions and what defines us. Christ follower. It's not enough, as it were, to believe in a God who created life, universe, and everything. Because then you just have the universe as it is. We take it a step further. We believe that this God was a kind and loving God who sent his son to die for us. That's uh, kind of the entire point. And that because God, who created life, the universe, and everything, is willing to die for you, loves you that much to take care of you, you should be willing to go out and love your fellow man. Charity work like George Mueller's, is baked into the Christian religion. It's what defines the faith in a lot of ways. It's what makes us different from any random Joe Schmo who thinks the universe was created by a giant platypus. That's not Christianity. There's an important distinction to be made there. Verse 21 and 22 that we read already. Uh, remember Abraham that he was particularly marked as a man of faith. And so, and so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. I praise indeed. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. That yes, Abraham was considered the friend of God <coughs> through his faith, but that faith specifically resulted in specific actions, namely being willing to sacrifice his son to God. And I don't think we're all, again, I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all, we're all called to do X, dot, and Y. I certainly hope it's not standard practice for fathers to be willing to commit human sacrifice. I hope that's not in the uh, Bill of Rights, as it were. But that we all show our faith by our actions. That if we truly and properly understand Christ and what he did for us, then we will act a certain way. It's a brilliant illustration. And I think when you get down to it, that's Abraham in a nutshell, to be used nowadays just as he was used in the New Testament, as an example to maybe not imitate, but to look up to, as reference for what a proper Christ-like life will look like, which is an impressive accomplishment considering he lived a couple thousand years before Christ came around. I think that about wraps us up this morning. I kind of like the book of James quite a bit. I accidentally stumbled across it just looking up Abraham in the New Testament. Um, but I think there's a lot of meat in those five chapters that I would love to cover in future sermons. So we're going to go back, back to the proper beginning next week with James chapter 1. 
Or at least that is my current intention. If the man upstairs says otherwise, we'll do otherwise. So before we dismiss this morning, does anyone need a special touch or prayer? All right, then. If Sister Jane would dismiss us and bless our food.